bedroom, this is the touch that truly sets it apart. Now available for you at hotelcollection.com. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Honored to be with you. We are following two sentencing hearings this afternoon here at Court TV. In California, convicted double murderer Ali Abulaban faces up to life in prison for the murder of his wife, Anna, and her friend, Rayburn Barron. The TikTok star admitted to being jealous of Anna when he took the stand at his trial, telling the jury that he was very impulsive. We are also standing by in Wisconsin, where now convicted killer Kevin Seamer faces up to 30 years in prison after a man he knocked unconscious outside of a wine bar last summer died from those injuries. We expect to hear several victim impact statements from the victim Josh Davies family, including from his wife Jennifer, who testified at that trial. We'll bring you that sentencing in just a bit. But first, let's head back to California, where the judge is about to sentence convicted murderer Ali Abulaban. First, we'll take care of some preliminary matters. Uh, as a matter of law, the defendant is ineligible for probation. But if he was eligible for probation, this court would not give him probation. The court acknowledges its discretion and obligation at reviewing verdicts from when we get first degree murders to see if it's second degree or even voluntary manslaughter. Um, and I will explain also as the defense has asked that I have the authority to strike or reduce the gun enhancements. Uh, I also have the authority to run the LWAP sentences consecutive or concurrent. And let me kind of briefly go through that and why I am giving the sentence that I am giving you. First of all, as to the first degree murder, I look at various factors having sat through the trial. And I do this in every murder trial. And I don't take this lightly. I truly respect jury verdicts. Uh, have I reduced a first degree murder to second degree? I have. In fact, I did it two weeks ago. But I'm not doing it today, and I'll explain why it's not happening today. Very simple reason. The jury heard all of the evidence. The jury evaluated all of the evidence. The jury came back with a first-degree verdict, which was the correct verdict. It was a verdict that, when you look at the totality of all that happened during this particular crime, it's the only verdict a reasonable person could come up with. And considering all the evidence, we, and I'll just hit a few high points that I think honestly the jury was looking at. The defendant's text message to his cousin about killing. Defendant's controlling demeanor, demeaning behavior. When he said just a few minutes ago, he wants us to know who he is, that's who he is. It's very clear from the videos. His driving over to the apartment with a loaded gun. The fact that the victims were helpless, completely taken by surprise. The planning of a listening device. Firing within seconds of entering the apartment. Clearly showing an intent to kill. Not heat of passion. Willful, deliberate, premeditated, cold-blooded murder. And something that is hard to explain, Ray was not involved in their problems at all. But he shot Ray first. Shot him in the head. And in an intent to kill. You don't shoot people in the head unless you want to kill them. And in front of Anna. That was deliberate. He wanted her to see it. Very cruel. 
He took photos immediately afterwards. Who does that? He calls his mother. He had three days on the, on the stand to explain his actions. He explained them. And the jurors came up again with the only reasonable verdict, which is a first degree verdict. They also found, because there was two deaths, that this was multiple murder under Penal Code Section 190.2A3. The next thing this court has to consider is the gun enhancements. In the state of California, the legislature has both slowly and quickly changed certain enhancements, and the court is obligated to look at reducing certain enhancements, including those that require or have a 20 plus year addition to the sentence. And again, I look at both mitigating and aggravating factors. Of course, it goes without saying this crime in great, involved great violence, it involved a firearm, it involved vulnerable, vulnerable witnesses, uh, victims who, again, had no time to react, no time to defend themselves. It involved planning. I, I don't think you could say it was sophistication or professionalism, but it certainly involved planning when you load a gun, arm yourself with a gun, drive 10 or 15 minutes to an apartment complex. As we saw on video, his demeanor going up the elevator, his demeanor going down the elevator, that showed planning. And obviously it was a, he took advantage of a position of trust. There's clearly that she didn't know he had a key, but he took advantage of that. Now, there are certain factors that, as for mitigating factors under the rules of court, I don't find any, zero, none. I am, there are certain factors with the defendant that I am obligated to take a look at. I acknowledge he has no prior record. Uh, I acknowledge the fact that at the, at the time of this killing, he had, was suffering substance abuse and had certain, some mental health issues. Um, but I reject the fact that his childhood contributed to this at all. That was, I, I hear terrible childhoods day in and day out. And his was not ideal, but it wasn't what we hear in this particular court. Uh, and I don't think that any of these crimes were connected, in fact, to his mental health or his even his substance abuse. Uh, he was over, over 26. Uh, it did involve intimate partner violence, but he was the one that was committing the violence on her. Uh, and of course, he denied when confronted with it what happened initially. So the court is not going to strike or reduce the gun enhancements. The question then becomes one of whether or not these life without possibility of parole should be consecutive or concurrent. And that's a big deal. That will in all likelihood determine whether or not he dies in prison or out of prison, whether he dies a free man or one who's not. And this is the bottom line on this is I've watched him here t during all of this time. He's a very talented actor. He is a very talented actor. Uh, when I saw the Scarface videos, it's as if when he committed these crimes, he became that persona of Scarface, of just the cold-blooded killing without remorse. Any tears that he's cried in this courtroom have been for himself. They are not for Ray and Anna. It's just, that's the reality. He fears the consequences, as he should, of his actions. But as he sits here today, I don't know if he's really sorry. 
I have serious reservations about it. I know he's sorry about the consequences of going to prison for the rest of his life, but I can't say that I think he's sorry for having killed these two innocent human beings. He's a very selfish person, as I think the jury saw. That, that was something that his character kind of came through. And we ask, who is Ali Abulaban? That's who he is. He's somebody that is only thinking about himself. And the idea of killing two innocent people doesn't disturb him. It's chilling. So the bottom line here is he will die in prison. He will never be a free man. He will take his last breath there. In this, in this, please, please, please. In this matter, the defendant on count one will be sentenced to life without the possibility of probation via Penal Code Section 1190.2, parent A, parent three. Consecutive to that will be 25 years to life on the gun enhancement under Penal Code Section 12022.53D. Consecutive to count one will be count two, which will be life without the possibility of parole. Penal Code Section 190.2, parent A3. Consecutive to that will be the gun enhancement of 25 to life under Penal Code Section 12022.53D. Total prison term. 50 years to life plus LWAP, life without the possibility of parole. He's given the following custody credits of 1,552 days. He is given the following fines and fees. Your Honor, um, probation has credits of 1,052 as of today. Okay, 1,052. He will uh, pay a restitution fine of 10,000 under Penal Code Section 1202.4B. Court security fee of 80 under Penal Code Section 1465.8. Criminal conviction fee of 60. A, the general order of restitution. Restitution at today's time will be set at uh, for the funeral expenses uh, of $12,890. And what was your other restitution amounts? Just so the uh, record is clear, that $12,890 is to the Victim Compensation Board. Correct. Uh, the amount to Amalia Miller is $3,324.24. You can cancel that, Mr. Okay. I, I can't. Please don't interrupt. Go ahead. And the amount to Herme Sarton is $1,214.66. All right, those amounts will be also ordered. All right, thank you all. Your Honor, may I just, I just want to make one clarification. When the court announced the sentence, 50 to life plus LWAP, is that plus two terms of LWAP, one for each? Case? As I indicated, the counts one and two on LWAP under the special circumstance has alleged and pled and proven under Penal Code Section 190.2, parent A, are consecutive to each other. So that's two consecutive LWAP terms Plus, on each count, 25 to life, totaling 50 to life, plus OWAP. So, yes, they are consecutive to each other. Thank you. In charge? Is it because it's LWAP, there's not a second 10,000? Yeah, we'll just do okay. it once. Okay. All right, we'll be in recess. Folks, please Ali Abulaban got the absolute max that he could from this judge. Boy, did he look angry when the courtroom started clapping. He started his sarcastic clapping. Perfect time to bring in our guest in studio trial attorney Kelly Hyman, remotely trial attorney, former president of the National Bar Association, C.K. Hoffler. Thank you, ladies, both for being with me. Kelly, you and I are here watching it together, and uh, we both said, look how angry he looks if looks could kill. If looks could kill, definitely mm. he could kill someone at that moment. And when I was watching what happened, how you were talking about how he was clapping, and it looked like he, you know, said a curse word and stuff like that. And the way in which he looked at the judge of just this angry, menacing look, definitely, as we say, like Scarface. You know, that before when he gave his speech, it, he was a different, different person. He was, he made a mistake. It was, it was much more eloquent. And 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 now when the judge ruled, basically through the 
the book at him, you could see a totally different side of him. Oh, you're right. And I think it, it, and it goes exactly to what CK, this judge, was saying. Some of those things, like, I think he's a very talented actor. His tears were only for himself. And then he also talks about the demeanor on the elevator showed intent. The crimes were not connected to his mental health or substance abuse. And this is why the judge gave him the absolute most sentence that he could. Do you agree with the judge, CK? I do agree with the judge. For this reason, this these crimes are heinous, not because of the very nature of the fact that he murdered two people. The, the judge, in giving an explanation for his sentence, used words such as cold-blooded, selfish, intentional. He used some of the strongest words that I've heard, actually, a judge used in sentencing. And he wanted to be very, very clear of why he was sentencing this defendant, what he felt he did when he testified for three days, how he was making a mockery of the system, how he's a talented actor. He saw through every orifice of deception of the body of this, this, this defendant, and he wanted to make sure the record reflected that, and he was not gonna cut him any slack. He, this is probably one of the most severe sentences that I've seen based on the justification that the judge gave, much less the sentence itself, but the justification and the language so it's pretty tight for appellate purposes, but I think the judge got it right. I agree with you. It is tight for appellate purposes. CK, one last question for you, Kelly, and that is, what did you think of the fact that the judge said, I find zero mitigating factors, zero. Typically, there's one or two the judge throws out there. He found none. The judge was very methodical in the way he, which he made the determination mm. of that and basically said there are none, but then went through them as well and, and talked about them and made sure, for the appellate reasons, right, that he considered these, but based on his consideration, there is no mitigating factors. His childhood, people have rough childhood. This was nothing. The issues with the drugs, nothing. The way in which this, he way, he, the way in which he handled himself was not justifiable and threw the book at him. Yeah, and again, I thought when he started his, and I would say sarcastic clapping ladies when the rest of the courtroom is doing it, I thought, wow, there we see your true colors. There you're doing exactly what the judge said you would because you have no remorse. I think an evil person has just been sentenced. All right, coming up next, we're going to switch gears. We'll head to Wisconsin for the sentencing hearing for Kevin Seymour. That's next. Tonight on Closing Arguments, the murder of Dan Markell and the case against his ex-mother-in-law. We're diving deeper into today's big hearing and the mounting evidence against her. Closing Arguments, tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Donna Ailson is facing charges of murder, the death of her former son-in-law. This is terrible. Now that Donna has turned into a defendant, what's next for the Adelson clan? The Matriarch Mastermind Murder Trial begins September 17th on Court TV. Turning now to Wisconsin, where defendant Kevin Seymour is set to be sentenced in the tattoo punch murder trial. A jury found Seymour guilty last month of felony murder during aggravated battery after a man that he knocked out died from those injuries. 39-year-old Josh Davies sustained two skull fractures when he hit the pavement outside of a wine bar last summer. But during Seymour's trial, the defense tried to say that Seymour never punched Davies and that Davies sustained his injuries when he slipped and fell while he was actually attacking the defendant, Seymour. Ultimately, the jury ended up siding with the state, and Seymour now faces up to 30 years behind bars for the murder of Josh Davies. Let's go into court now for the start of the sentencing hearing. Matter of State of Wisconsin versus Kevin Seymour, 23 CF 966. Can I have the appearance this place? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sue Opper and Melissa Zillavi appearing for the state of Wisconsin. John Shiro and Jeffrey Jensen on behalf of and with Mr. Seymour. Thank you. The uh, defendant was uh, convicted of a count of felony murder on August 1st, 2024, following a jury verdict. The court scheduled the matter for sentencing for today. The court has received a number of letters that have been filed um, from individuals um, 
speaking on behalf of the um, primary victim in this case, the deceased. And I've reviewed all of those. I've also received a um, sentencing memorandum from Mr. Shiro, along with uh, character letters in support of the defendant. And I've reviewed all of that. Uh, the court uh, made uh, counsel aware, and I will make a record, that I've also uh, was forwarded without solicitation a um, screenshot of uh, apparently a Facebook post that someone posted regarding this sentencing today, um, expressing their um, support for the deceased. Uh, the court um, is making the parties aware of that, and I informed the parties that the information contained in that post was not particularly different than what has already been submitted to me in writing in terms of speaking about the concern um, for the um, loss um, of Josh. And I did not consider it to be um, something that would somehow compromise my capacity today. But because it occurred, I wanted to make the parties aware of it. Um, is the state prepared for sentencing? Yes, sir. Is the defense prepared? Yes, sir. Uh, I understand there may be speakers, uh, potentially on both sides. Uh, Ms. Hopper, um, in terms of presentation, Yes, Your Honor, uh, I'll be making my comments first, and then I'll ask the court to hear from the families. Thank you, and that's what my question was going to be, so thank you. Uh, I'll turn to you then, Ms. Opper, and hear first from you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, thank you for um, allowing us the opportunity to present some comments to you for sentencing, and uh, for the record, we have complied with victim rights notification. I expect you will be hearing from family members of uh, our victim, Josh Davies. A uh, couple of things that I think are relevant for the court to consider here this afternoon is you just determine what is an appropriate sentence for uh, Mr. Seamer for his involvement in this incident. Uh, First and foremost, I will state the obvious, and that is the jury has spoken. Uh, this was a uh, case that was litigated fairly. Um, many uh, witnesses were presented to the jury. Many pieces of video evidence were presented to the jury. And at the end of the day, the jury concluded that Mr. Seamer is guilty of this offense, and that in fact underlying this offense was an intentional act of inflicting bodily harm on another human being. So I dispute any suggestion that this was an accident or that this was a two-sided bar fight or anything of the sort based on the testimony and the evidence that was presented at trial in which um, we clearly laid out this was not a two-sided argument. There was no argument at all. Josh Davies repeatedly walked away from Kevin Seamer, repeatedly tried to uh, calm the situation, and none of it had any effect on Mr. Seamer. Mr. Seamer continued with his um, loud, antagonizing, vulgar um, fighting words, as I described them uh, to the jury, despite Josh's best, best efforts to walk away. There was even a point in time where uh, one of the witnesses, Laura Burke, had tried to get Kevin to leave and go out the back and join up with his friends and just walk away from the situation. So there were many opportunities, as we presented to the jury, for Mr. Seamer to simply walk away. A lot of times, Judge, and you've been doing this a long time, I've been doing this a long time, Mr. shiro has been doing this a long time, a lot of times we have a trial and it brings some satisfaction to those involved because they feel like they get more answers and they get a better picture as to what happened. And this is one of those cases where I think everyone in this courtroom is still scratching their head going, what the heck happened here? And why? Why did this happen? And I've thought about this case a lot in the last year, Your Honor. I happen to have been on call when this happened. And 
remember distinctly getting woken up in the middle of the night um, by the Heartland Police Department as they described for me what had happened and how the injuries were so serious. And certainly in this business, we see bar fights. We see people arguing over stupid things in bars at two o'clock in the morning. That's not what this was. It never was that. Not even for Kevin Seymour. And that's what I think is such a hard struggle. The night was perfect by all accounts. I mean, he was out with his buddy. He was having a good time. He was listening to the band. He ran into some old friends. He met a new friend. What was it that triggered this violent attack on Josh Davies? We don't know, but it certainly speaks to his character, which is one of the uh, relevant factors this court has to consider, and the need to protect the public. There's no indication, and, and we showed the video of him standing in the bar by himself waiting for Ms. Burke and the others to arrive. He seemed perfectly normal. There was nothing about his demeanor, his appearance, his attitude. And for him to flip a switch like that and just go after Mr. Davies, first verbally and then physically, for no reason, really is concerning, Judge. Because we have to consider protection of the public. What is there to say this wouldn't happen again? We don't even know what triggered it in the first place. pleading that the judge has to consider the public and their safety. Before we head to break, a quick programming note. Another highly anticipated trial is kicking off next week on Court TV. It's the My Daughter Did It murder trial for the defendant, Lori Shaver. Shaver is accused in the death of her husband, but she is claiming that her daughter, who was eight at the time, is the real killer. Shaver's defense alleges the girl shot and killed her father after a violent altercation and an effort to protect her mother. Jury selection is set to begin on Monday, and you will see that trial right here with us on Court TV. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Before we get you back to court, we have a quick update out of Massachusetts where defendant Karen Reed is speaking out as she awaits her second trial for the death of her Boston police officer, John O'Keefe. Reed, who did not testify at her first murder trial, gave ABC 2020 an exclusive interview in which she described finding O'Keefe dead in a blizzard and also doubled down on her allegations of a cover-up. Take a listen. My eyes are peeled and I said he's right there. I jumped out the passenger side and I fell into the street. His eyes were shut and he had spots of blood in different areas on his face and he was still. Not stiff, but, but still. It was cold. I felt cold, but I didn't feel dangerously cold. And it was just an odd feeling to know that I'm okay. I'm not dying, but he's here with me and he's dying and I can't warm him up. That exclusive interview was recorded before her first trial, but has never been fully published. If the case stays on schedule, a second trial is expected to begin in January of next year. This hour, we are in the state of Wisconsin for a sentencing hearing underway for Kevin Seamer. Seamer was found guilty by a jury earlier this month for felony murder and aggravated battery, all in connection to a fatal fistfight that left one man dead due to a punch by the defendant. Jurors deliberated for less than three hours during the guilt phase. Now, Seymour will learn his sentence for those crimes. Let's get you back into court for the hearing. Being in the community and, and uh, the need to protect the public is great. I want to remind the court of the matters that we filed in our other acts motion, and hopefully the court got a chance to review that, but if not, I'm going to briefly touch on that because I think it is relevant. Obviously, Mr. Shiro's going to put his own slant on these events, but one event goes back, I think, to 2015. It was a, a dispute with a neighbor that apparently began uh, when a contractor arrived to remove some plants or trees or something on the property line. And re what was reported to the police was that Mrs. Seamer took exception to that, and she went out and confronted the contractor and there was some exchange of words between them. And then she returned to the house and told her husband what was going on. And Mr. Seymour ran out and confronted the contractor. 
and was reported to be chest bumping the contractor and telling him, I'm going to put you into a hole. That was in 2015. Maybe not the crime of the century. He was not cited, he was not charged with that, but it was reported to the police and a, a neighbor across the street confirmed at least part of what the contractor reported, that he had seen Mr. Steamer in the other person's face yelling at him. What's more concerning, Your Honor, is the events of uh, uh, June of 2022 and the incident that occurred at a car wash in Elm Grove that was reported to the police where a 15-year-old boy was working at the car wash and described that Mr. Seamer apparently was a customer, became upset with some of the equipment or the uh, uh, facility, something going on at the car wash, and so the employee, the boy, went out and attempted to help him, and Mr. Seamer became aggressive with the boy and threatened that boy, physically taking a vacuum from the, from the uh, car wash and pushing it into the boy's chest, and then threatening that boy too, I'll put you into next week. Really, really concerning inappropriate behavior. The boy became concerned, went inside and got his manager. The manager came out, an adult, again, attempts made to intervene to calm the situation down. Mr. Seamer continued with his rant, was vulgar, and was reported to have thrown a towel or some other object at the manager. So I read the character letters that were provided on behalf of Mr. Seamer. I don't doubt much of what is said in there, but I continue to scratch my head and try and understand how can we have such a dichotomy here? How can we have this Jekyll and Hyde uh, individual before the court and decide what's a fair sentence? If he can flip that quickly over minor, insignificant events with strangers, that's the concern for the public. People are not known to him, only have brief interactions with him and he's flying off the handle and threatening them with physical violence, that's a significant concern. And that's really what I hope to convey to the court here today is that it's just uh, a situation where, um, in my opinion, Your Honor, unless there's incarceration, significant incarceration for Mr. Seamer, we cannot protect the public. We cannot make sure that our community is safe because we don't know who he's going to become upset with next. The, um, the facts of the case, Your Honor, I am not going to relitigate. You listen to them entirely. I know Mr. Shiro continues to insist this was a fall or an accident or a two-sided argument. I do uh, reject those positions of the defense entirely. I think the jury did as well. I'll be frank with the court. Before we went to trial, I told this family my concern, and I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but my concern was a hung jury. Now, I wasn't afraid of a verdict one way or the other. I was afraid of a hung jury and, and the jurors not being able to tell what exactly happened or who to believe, so to speak. But as the witnesses testified and as the um, facts of the case were presented in the courtroom, it, I thought became very clear, again, relying on not so much the video from the street or from the pharmacy trying to show the street. We all acknowledge that video was um, not as helpful as we all hope, right? But Still in studio with us, we have trial attorney Kelly Hyman and remotely trial attorney, former president of the National Bar Association, C.K. Hoffler. C.K., let me start with you. As you're listening to this unfold, and as is typical, they're arguing to the court the reasons why the court should be lenient or not. What are your thoughts so far? Well, I think um, the prosecutor, the district attorney has done a good job in laying out the public interest, how this um, gentleman is a danger, the defendant is a danger to the public, and why a very significant sentence, not a light sentence, but a significant sentence is in order to protect the public because he flies off the handle. He, they cited two incidents, by the way, he wasn't convicted, but two instances, one, there was a police report, I believe I'm not certain about the second, 2015, 2022, where it was very evident that he does fly off the handle and he threatens with bodily harm or he actually 
ex executes on that. So very similar behavior without talking about pattern and practice, she's talking about a pattern and practice. Exactly, and, good point. And I think that's very compelling. It is, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you're right. Even though you may not supposed to be doing that, the way she's done it is getting that in there for the court to consider. But Kelly, I just made the comment to me, this is just sad. This is just a sad, drunken, stupid case of violence that should not have happened and should not have resulted in the death of a young man. Jekyll and Hyde, that's how the DA presents the defendant, that he can so quickly turn that he can be one moment one way and then another moment go another way and she gave kind of two examples of that fact but this as you stated should not have happened right the 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 jekyll shouldn't turn into the hide so to speak he should have just stayed where he was and the other person he was trying to allegedly get away from from him as as well yeah this case all right ck if you were representing this defendant or quite frankly any defendant with this type of guilty conviction would you allow them to speak if they wanted to be heard at sentencing no I would not because um, and the reason for that is because I think he could make matters worse um, if he is prone to um, not be able to control his temper um, he's very emotionally charged just as a general proposition a sentencing hearing is not the time to to explore whether he is going to be explosive or not I would leave well enough alone and let the lawyers argue on his behalf yeah that's a good point all right Kelly now the state was arguing when they first started out the jury's already determined judge this was an intentional act of inflicting bodily harm enough said we want the max the max he faces up to 30 years in prison if you see someone like this in this type of offense do you think 30 years in prison would be just or not well, the intent is key in this case, right? And the jury did make that determination that he had intent, that he had that specific intent to do this harm. And so that's going to be key. Do the ends justify the means? I mean, he, the poor gentleman died. And no matter how much time he does in jail, it's not going to bring him back. It's not going to be justification for the family because they don't have him any more because of what happened so for some it's not enough time yeah and ck does the age make a difference if you have a defendant who's 20 versus a little bit older as this gentleman is he's not 20 anymore does that make a difference to the court or rather should it make a difference I think it sometimes does make a difference, but in this case, where the jury said they found he intended to do this, and the jury basically showed no mercy, I think what their message is, maximum sentence, and I think that that's not their, this that factor, his age, is not going to be a point of sympathy for the court in pronouncing the sentence. All right, ladies, stay by. We are going to have to head to a quick break, but a quick programming note. Court TV's original series, Victim to Verdict, is back for a new season. It begins this Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern. You don't want to miss this. In the season premiere, Court TV's Ted Rollins will break down the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial as two celebrities reveal their turbulent relationship to the world and all those details. It all starts this Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on Court TV Live. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Go ahead. Hit me. Bam. Two celebrities reveal their turbulent relationship to the world. He was just Hollywood's mega hunk. The man who beat me up for five years. The general public sees this and all they see is wife beater. Two completely different versions of what was happening. That means one thing, somebody's lying. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. New season premieres Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. We are in Wisconsin this afternoon for sentencing in the Tattoo Punch murder trial. Defendant Kevin Seamer was found guilty of felony murder just last month. Now, Seamer will learn his fate for delivering a fatal punch to the face of 39-year-old Josh Davies, who eventually died after hitting his head on the concrete. Let's get you back into the courtroom for more of the sentencing hearing for Kevin Seamer. I'd bar that because it's not a stretch. It's not difficult to know 
knowing Mr. Seamer's behavior, knowing his character at that point in time, that he would go out on that sidewalk and punch Mr. Davies in the head. He said as much. He said as much earlier. Go outside and practice falling down. I'll be right out. And he was going to um, challenge both Mr. Davies and his friend. So there, there's really no doubt this was intentional conduct by Mr. Seamer, that he wanted to hurt Mr. Davies. His words and actions support that fully. We were measured in our approach in this prosecution, Your Honor, and charged him with intentional homicide. Um, we looked at all different degrees of homicide, all different uh, possible charges that could be issued, and we settled on this one because, because we thought it was fair, and we thought it fit the facts of the case, and I still believe that. And as a result of the felony murder conviction, he sits here with an exposure of 21 years, whereas most homicides he'd be looking at 25, 30, 40 years. So I asked the court to take into account that this was a fair, uh, reasonable outcome for this case. Nobody suggests Mr. Seamer wanted to kill Mr. Davies, but we do contend that he wanted to harm him and inflict bodily harm on him, and that is clear from his actions and words. Actions have consequences, and that's exactly where we're at today. Um, Mr. Seamer's actions caused Josh Davies to lose his life for no reason. I'm gonna ask the family to speak to you about Josh and who he was and what he was, but I have clearly um, been told many times he was a, a loving husband, a great partner to his wife, uh, a good stepfather to his wife's son, a good son, a good brother, uh, a good friend, somebody that this community misses. This just didn't have to happen. And there's only one person to blame for it, and that's Kevin Seymour, and he needs to be held accountable for those actions. So by my calculation, and I think uh, it's agreed upon by the parties, uh, maximum term of imprisonment here is 21 years, maximum confinement would be 15.75 years, and maximum term of supervision would be 5.25 years. The state's asking for 15 years of confinement. I know that's a big number. I know he doesn't have a prior criminal record, but he certainly has prior history. And the consequences of his actions are so dire and so uh, significant that I think that number is warranted, Your Honor. Did we agree with the... Uh, Credit, time credit? credit. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll work. we'll work on that, Your Honor. Um, and other than that, um, I'm not aware of any um, restitution that's been requested. Um, yes? We need a restitution hearing. That's right, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me, Ms. Peterson reminded me. The family is not requesting restitution, but the Office of Crime Victim Compensation has uh, paid out the claim, and um, we would request a restitution hearing. We have been in contact with them since the verdict and in preparation of the hearing today, but they have not completed their uh, analysis, and uh, I, it's my understanding they're working with Aurora Summit to determine the medical bills for Mr. Davies. Remember, he survived for quite some time and was hospitalized for quite some time, which adds to the um, stress for the family, of course, but also uh, to the restitution, so. Uh, on that subject, I'm likely to give a restitution status date so that any claim can be received and reviewed by the defense and to uh, do a check-in as to the position of the parties to see whether or not a full restitution hearing is needed. Um, Ms. Hopper, um, do you have any other comments? No other comments from the state, Your Honor, if you would then hear from the family members. I would. I will get a microphone. Would you, uh, with the assistance of your office, bring forward who is to speak? And you said how many are there? Three total. All right, thank you. If you would hold that microphone close. Goodbye to Kelly Hyman. C.K. Hoffler will be sticking around. Coming up next, Michael Ayala joins me for victim impact statements in the sentencing hearing for Kevin Seamer. Up first, Josh Davies' wife will be right back.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcox. And I'm Michael Ayala. We're both here today giving you your front row seat to justice. And we are in Wisconsin this hour where now convicted killer Kevin Seamer is being sentenced today. A Waukesha County jury deliberated less than three hours before finding Seamer guilty of felony murder during aggravated battery after a man that he knocked out died from those injuries. 39-year-old Josh Davies was a stranger to Seamer when he first encountered him at a wine bar last summer. Surveillance footage shows Seymour speaking with Davies, who was out with his wife and his friend, before an altercation broke out over Davies' tattoos. The fight proceeded outside, where Seymour punched Davies, knocking him to the ground. Davies would later die from his injuries. We are going to get you back into that courtroom in just a bit. But first, we do want to begin in Georgia, where high school shooting suspect Colt Gray and his father, Colin Gray, made their first court appearances this morning. 14-year-old Colt Gray has been charged with four counts of felony murder after investigators say he used an AR-style rifle to shoot and kill four people at his high school on Wednesday. His father also now faces four counts of involuntary manslaughter after allegedly buying his son the rifle used in the shooting as a Christmas present. He's also facing murder murder charges, second degree murder charges. Yeah, they've added those as well. Mm -hmm. Joining us live now outside of Appalachia High School in Winder, Georgia is Court TV producer Cody Thomas. Cody, I know you've been out there. You've been speaking with people. Tell us what's the latest, please. Well, good afternoon, uh, Judge Ashley and Michael. Of course, as you two just pointed out, the two uh, father-son duo, Colt and Colin, made their first appearances in court today. Both men walking into the courtroom in their jail uniform, shackled by wrist and on their ankles. Colin Gray actually showing a little more emotion than Colt. He was crying as he walked into the courtroom and throughout the duration of that arraignment. And as that was mentioned, uh, he, after un investigators uncovered that he allegedly bought that AR-style weapon that Colt used, in this shooting as a holiday gift, even after Colt was already on the radar by police from last year in May of 2023 from prior school shooting threats. Now, the GBI held a presser yesterday evening talking about those charges against Colin Gray in further detail. Take a listen. He is charged with the following, four counts of involuntary manslaughter, two counts of second degree murder, and eight counts of cruelty to children. Mr. Gray, these charges stem from Mr. Gray knowingly allowing his son, Colt, to possess a weapon. Now, neither Colt nor Colin requested bond during today's arraignment, but they will be back in court on December 4th for a preliminary hearing. But the judge also mentioned that Colt will not face the death penalty, but will still be charged as an adult. Now, Cody, I know you've been out there sort of doing your thing. I know you had an opportunity to speak to some of the parents. What did they have to say? Well, Michael, I did speak to one mother whose son actually attends Appalachia High School. She says she couldn't believe the information she was hearing on Wednesday once she got that message about what was going on. And she also described the pain that she felt not only in herself, but once she came up here after the situation kind of calmed down, saw some of the other students and parents grieving the pain in their eyes. Listen to how she describes that. I didn't believe it at first. I didn't register. I had to reread um, the message that was sent to me, and I rushed as fast as I could to get over here. Um, parked up the street and ran all the way here until I finally heard from Jaden, and I knew he was okay, fortunately. Um, but seeing the faces of other parents and um, students in panic, it's, it's, it's gut-wrenching. It's, it's awful. We've been talking about that all day, um, how this new quote-unquote normal will be. I don't know walking into those doors um, whenever that will be um, and sitting in the class that you were in when all this went down. The It's going to be hard. It, it, it's just going to be hard. And how we go from here, I, I don't know. Ashley and Michael, that mother did let me know that her and her family have been talking exten extensively since the shooting occurred on Wednesday about their plan moving forward, like about how when the students will come back to school, if her children will actually come back to these specific hallways. She says that's still up in the air for now, but she wanted to reiterate that 
Um, she still believes that Winder, Georgia is a safe community despite this tragic event. Yeah, I used to work up in Winder, Georgia. It's a very safe community and very good people in that community. I just can't even imagine what these families are going through. But I understand, Cody, you also had an opportunity to speak to students at that school. That's right, Ashley. I spoke to two students, one who luckily was not in Inside the building that day. She was absent, but she heard about what was going on from her friends in social media and, of course, the news. But I also spoke to another student. He says he was only two classrooms down from where those initial shots rang out. Take a listen to how they describe it. I heard about it because all my friends started texting me. My best friend, Kaylee, that goes here, texted me. And then my cousin, his girlfriend, goes here. She's the one that was involved. And I started texting her. I got a word from her this morning that she's okay. And I just said, thank goodness you're okay. And I said, I know, I know Coach A and I know how, the teacher, the other teacher. And it really hit when I found out. And I told my mom, and she said, it's not real. And I said, yes, it is. I'm getting word. Everybody's texting me and telling me it is. When I told her, it hit, and she could tell by my face. And I just bawled crying. It was pretty scary. I know I was two classes away from where it happened. It was in the same hallway as me because the girl in my class had gone to the restroom. She had come back. She had opened the door. I was about to get up to go to the restroom right before I went is when it happened. It was like 10 shots, about a three-second or four-second pause, and then like seven more. So I was very close. So, so you, you heard it? Like you heard everything? In my chest. Like, that's how, like it echoes through the hallways. Like the sound like it hits. Yeah. You, you can't just hear it. You can feel it too. Ashley and Michael, the community is still showing up out here on the Appalachia High School campus by the dozen, showing support, crying tears, hugging each other, just being there for each other during this tragic time. All right, Cody, thank you so much for that report. Great work out there. We'll continue to check in with you on the hour. All right, folks, so right now I want to turn back to Wisconsin and go back to court for the sentencing hearing for Kevin Seamer. Right now, victim Josh Davies' wife, who was with him the night that he died, is about to give a victim impact statement. So... Let's go back to court. And uh, just give the who you are. <clears throat> My name is Jennifer Davies, the late wife of Joshua Davies. I would like to start with a Bible quote. Proverbs 16, verse 5. The Lord detests all the proud of heart, but be sure of this, that they will not go unpunished. I never imagined that I would be in a courtroom for the murder of my husband, addressing the pain, sadness, and devastation, financial burden I have endured because of Kevin's carelessness actions, making me a widow at 42 by murdering my beloved Joshua. I started a journal in the hospital. The first page was titled, the day your life changed forever, dated June 17th. Little did I realize it was not only Josh's life, but everyone else's life that would be changed due to Kevin's actions and choices. I sat in the hospital and documented each hour of every day, praying and hoping that one day Josh would wake up and I could tell him the journey that he had and the way to recovery. But that never happened. Every day since June 17th, nearly every thought and conversation has been about this tragedy that Kevin caused to my family. My life will never be the same, 447 days and counting. And I always wonder when or if this PS PTSD will ever go away. Josh was filled with laughter, love, and kindness. His love for me and our integrity meant the world to him and I as well. In the 10 years of marriage, Josh came to every football and lacrosse game and school function, whether near or far, to support our son. His loud, encouraging cheers will forever be missed, especially to our son. Let me tell you that it was very hard going to the games this past year without him, and forever it will be. We only had Josh for 39 years. Kevin's family and friends had time together for 67. I wouldn't have given anything to have cherished and loved 28 more years or longer with Josh. But as we know that that was taken away from me and our family with Kevin's actions on June 17th. 
I plead to you to consider my loss and excruciating pain I will ever, forever have in my heart along with Kevin's actions when you consider the duration of this sentence. <laughs> Thank you for letting me speak, Your Honor. Thank you for being here, ma'am. Hey, ma'am, can you tell me who you are? I'm Jamie, Josh's sister. All right. First, I want to say thank you to everyone who has come to support me and my family through this difficult time. My name is Jamie, and Josh was my big brother. As my only sibling, losing him felt as though my heart's been ripped in half. Josh was my biggest supporter and always there when I needed him no matter what. He had a way of lighting up a room with his bright smile, contagious laugh, and always gave the best hugs. Life has not been the same without him. I miss him every day. No matter how much time has passed, the heartache remains. <laughs> There will always be a hole in my heart from losing him the way I did. What Kevin did was hateful and cruel. His actions were selfish and inconsiderate. And now my family will no longer get to celebrate every birthday, holiday, and every special moment with Josh. All of this happened on what should have been a fun night out. It turned into something tragic and the worst night of my life. All because of Josh's tattoos and the way he looked. I hope Kevin and I hope Kevin thinks of Josh and the loss and heartache he has caused every time he sees someone with tattoos. Josh deserves justice. His life was cut way too short, and his friends and family will have to live with that for the rest of our lives. Due to the aggressive, belligerent nature of the Kevin's behavior that he exhibited towards Josh. I'm asking the court to consider the maximum penalty of the law so that he spends the rest of his life behind bars. Kevin, I hope one day you understand to the full extent the damage you have caused. We need to squeeze in a break. When we come back, we'll bring more of the victim impact statements. The parents of Josh Davies, the victim in this case, there he is. They will be speaking next. Stay tuned. It's the man who beat me up for five years. Two celebrities reveal their turbulent relationship to the world. Go ahead. Hit me. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. New season premieres Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a shooting at a Georgia high school leaves a community stunned. We'll bring you everything we've learned about this tragedy and the suspected shooting. Closing Arguments with Vinnie Politan. Tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. In the world of true crime, the path from victim to verdict is never a straight line. Join me for a Court TV original series that takes you through every dark twist and turn from the crime scene to the courtroom in America's most compelling cases. She killed my daughter and he marries her. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins, a Court TV original series. New season premieres September 8th. Only on Court TV. Back now to Wisconsin for the sentencing hearing for Kevin Seamer. He was found guilty last month of felony murder during aggravated battery after a man that he punched died from those injuries. Prosecutors told the jury that Seamer punched victim Josh Davies at a wine bar last year after making a comment about his tattoos. But Seamer's defense claimed that Seamer was simply defending himself because he thought that Davies was going to hit him with a bar stool. All right, let's get you back into court now where we continue. And I believe the parents yes. of the victim in this case, Josh Davies will be talking now. So let's get back in. Well, could you tell me who you are? No, Judge. Can, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, I'm Patty Pearson Davies. And I'm, I'm, this is Edward Davies, I'm, I'm, mother and father uh, of Josh. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, sorry, I have my notes on my. That's phone. fine. Okay. Um, this is going to be the hardest 
probably the most important thing I've ever had to do in my life. Never expected to be here. Uh, I only hope that I can make it through this with the impact that's necessary to properly represent the importance of my son's voice in our family as he can no longer speak for himself. Uh, Joshua Ryan Davies, no one in the court is victim A, uh, speaking on his behalf, myself and Edward, better known as Ben. Josh was our firstborn and only son, 39 years young at the time that he, of his tragic untimely death on a date night with his wife and friends, still hard to believe. Josh would say, life is so precious. Hey, Mom, can you hold this? Thank you. Josh would say life is just so precious. You know, he always lived each day to the best of his ability and was kind to everybody. And he would say that, be kind to everybody you meet, live and let live, and always share a smile. And he did just that. Josh truly had a magnetic personality, a great work ethic, a smile, and hugs that were bigger than life itself. He brought so much joy to the lives of everybody he touched, his community, his work in landscaping, the many sports and outstanding athletes, things that he played most of all, he just loved everybody. But without question, his family and friends, he loved the most to his core. He would do anything for them. He truly was a shining star. Josh could get along with anybody. He didn't care if you were a somebody. He didn't care if you were a nobody. He just made everybody feel welcomed, loved, accepted, and appreciated. For Josh to have had to endure the bullying, the badgering, the harassment, the antagonization, the blatant disrespect, and then the pursuit and tragic act of violence, and the excruciating pain and suffering that he did for 27 days, causing his untimely death in July of 2023, for no good reason, is totally despicable, unexcusable, and unacceptable. Kevin Seymour, the defendant in this case, I'm not judging, but he was an older, much larger, mature individual who should have known better than to judge Josh, who he didn't even know, for the tattoos he had, which were not even offensive, or, or maybe it was the way he looked. But Josh was clearly targeted by Kevin Seymour because of his tattoos, attacked and killed. Killed for the way he looked, no different than somebody who was killed or harassed for the color of their skin. In my opinion, this was a murder and a hate crime and discrimination. The fact that Josh is gone forever is tragic and unfathomable for his family, all of us hundreds of friends across the country and the world. It's totally wrong for anybody to have judged, be judged by another for the way they look and targeted and killed because of it. Kevin Seymour, you took away Josh's life in the prime of his life. I don't care how nice of a man you may have exhibited to be in the past. That's obviously not who you are now. You pursued, attacked, and killed my, our only son for no reason by your behavior and your actions. In my opinion, a fist is just as bad as a gun or a knife or a drunk behind the wheel. Murder is murder. It's my belief that Kevin Seymour does not deserve a future dictated by his actions. Our son is dead. A life is the most valuable and cherished gift society has. Kevin Seymour has to understand and a, a precedence has to be set that bad choices, bad actions have consequences. In the case of a death, those consequences have to be severe. Even the nicest of people can make mistakes. We all know that, but we all have and make choices and have to take responsibility for them and be accountable for them. In this case, Josh's life is over. He's dead. Our lives have been changed forever for no good reason other than Kevin Seymour punched and subsequently killed our sons all because he didn't like his tattoos or for that matter him because from the moment he met him as he said in court he didn't like him that's the case why didn't you walk away his interest in talking with the two women had me questioning his purpose for even being there. Was he trying to impress them or be the big man on campus or what? My son kept walking away. You kept pursuing him. Josh was not going to leave that night without his wife. He was a devoted and loving husband. The defendant has been found guilty by a jury of this crime of murder, the most serious of crimes. 
the defendant has to be punished. A slap on the wrist for this type of action is simply not acceptable and, and would be condoning and accepting bad, illegal behavior. In my opinion, that position doesn't keep any of us safe. We need justice for Josh. The only way to right this wrong is to, give the defend to get the defendant off the streets and his animal-like behavior to be caged and controlled. Again, our loving son, brother, uncle, husband, father, and friend is dead, gone forever. Our entire family has had our hearts ripped out by the death of Josh. No longer able to see him, talk to him, hear his voice, receive his hugs. They were amazing, by the way. The pain and damage you, Kevin, have caused to him and so many others is just simply unbearable and unacceptable. You picked on the wrong guy when you picked on Josh. He was one of the good guys. He was actually the best. He was a big deal, and that was the nickname all his buddies had given him, and even the family we all started to call him that. He was a big deal. The defendant's choice in action that night was tragic. Clearly, he knew he did wrong. He fled the scene. Our son's gone forever. Nothing will ever bring him back. Kevin Seamer's blatant disrespect, disregard, violent behavior, arrogant attitude, and lack of remorse for another human being and his attack on our son deserves nothing less for him to be removed and kept from society and spend the rest of his life in prison to protect it, to protect everyone. As the saying goes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. History shows that Kevin Seamer has had altercations in the past with people people that were fortunate enough that they didn't result in a death until now. Therefore, on behalf of Joshua Davies, his family, and the hundreds of friends, we respectfully request that you sentence jo uh, Kevin Seymour to the maximum penalty the law will allow so that he can spend the rest of his life in prison to show that laws are in place for a reason and people can be safe knowing that criminals are being sentenced to the full extent of the law. This will send a message that this type of behavior cannot be condoned, condoned or tolerated. I just want to thank you for the time and thank everyone for everything you've done in Josh's behalf. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. I want to just say one couple of little things. Yes, sir. First, you killed my son, my only son, and I'd like to know why, over tattoos. Maybe somebody should look at you and not, you know, beat you up and kill you because you wear glasses or something. I Sir, know. direct your comments to me, please. Your comments to, to the court. And uh, I understand. Yeah. You know, so um, the man, <laughs> the animal is an animal. He belongs in a cage, and he deserves the maximum that is allowed to give him because of what he's done for no reason at all. My son did nothing. Good job. Did nothing at all Good job. to provoke this. Thank you, sir. Is Opera anyone else? Ah, uh, Judge, you could see the dad. He's just seething inside. And it, I think it was a good idea by the judge. I mean, it's protocol, but to tell him to speak to the court, not to him. Because I think had he kept talking to the defendant in this case, it might have turned ugly. Yeah, and we heard the wife tell him, okay, sit down. Yes. And I'm sure it was because she knew he was getting um, understandably upset. Really upset. All right, let's bring in our guest for this hour, still with us, trial attorney and former president of the National Bar Association, C.K. Hoffler. C.K., I'm sure you watched that, and you know, I'm very impressed by the mom there. She gave an incredible argument. Any prosecutor would be proud to give as far as arguing for the maximum for this guy. At the end of the day, though, Facts do matter, and this, I think, is a case where he got convicted of felony murder. But to say that he intended to kill this guy, I think, is problematic. I mean, the punch is bad, the fight was bad. I think it's clear by the evidence he was the instigator. But again, in terms of putting him away, the facts do matter, don't they? The facts do matter, uh, Michael. As you said, the facts do matter, absolutely. But I do think in this instance, he may not have intended to kill him, but he certainly intended to do bodily harm. He intended to hurt him in some way. And these are the consequences of when you do this. And, and I think that the mother said it best 
I, I, you know, typically you wouldn't have just other incidents where he was not convicted um, to be even admissible in this setting. Um, but the 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 themes that both of, of all the impact statements tied in very nicely with the district attorney's comments, and I think they did an excellent job in presenting who he was and why the defendant should be put away for the maximum amount of time. And I, even though facts do matter, I think the jury also spoke very loudly in this case. And evidently, the evidence was so compelling that everyone wants him to see him put away for as long as he possibly can. And no one is paying any lip service or anything to the fact that he's an elderly gentleman, because they're thinking, this young man died at the prime of his life. You've had the luxury of living longer. He's been ripped from society. You deserve to be punished to the maximum amount. And I think that every single witness echoed that, and I believe that that probably was a sentiment of the jurors. But I think the mother's also saying, because you're older, you should have known better. Mm. You should not have done this. You shouldn't have instigated this. What do you think about the mother's comments? And I think the, the answer is they're searching for the why, because she said this had to have been, it was murder, it was a hate crime, discrimination, all because of the way he looked, his tattoos. I just don't know that that rationale is satisfying to any victim's family as a reason for this to have happened. Well, quite simply, no one knows why it happened. It is something that is inexplicable on many levels. Whether it was the tattoos, whatever it was, it never should have happened. He certainly intended to hurt him. He certainly intended to do him bodily harm, but he did not intend to kill him. But it happened in that way. And there was a certain amount of, it left a, a bad taste in your mouth what happened before the incident. And I think the mother saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks probably summarized how many people felt. And again, the theme building and the way that they presented their victim impact statements and how nicely it tied into the presentation that the district attorney did initially. I think that's very, very compelling. They, this, this, they absolutely did a great job, again, at presenting this. But I, I think the judge is going to, I think ultimately he's going to get the maximum amount of time. All right, we I shall. just think that those are the facts of this case. All right, we shall see. Uh, we're going to take a break here, CK. When we come back, the defense attorney is going to make their case as mm -hmm. to how much time they think he should get. And I believe we're also going to get to hear from the defendant himself. So keep it here on Court TV. Your front row seat to justice. This hour, we are in the state of Wisconsin, where sentencing is underway for Kevin Seymour. Seymour was found guilty by a jury just last month for felony murder and aggravated battery, all in connection to a fatal fist fight that left one man dead due to a punch from the defendant outside of a wine bar. Now, jurors deliberated for less than three hours during the guilt phase. Well, now, Seymour will learn his sentence for those crimes. I want to get you back in the court now as the defense begins their presentation. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Judge, I am going to start uh, by uh, playing a video, um, and I'm going to give us some history that needs to be somewhat recreated a bit. And I reference this in my uh, sentencing memorandum. <laughs> As the court is aware, uh, there was um, something, it, there was a, a number of videos that were created. And they were out, there were some inside the bar, the wine club, and there was really a couple that were outside, okay? And they kind of extended between the pharmacy and uh, Tabby's. And one of them, Your Honor, is has kind of a funny name. It was called Absolute Difference. And it was something that the person who was alleged to be an expert in this kind of videography uh, knew how to work. He used a, an app called App Amp 5 and then used uh, Adobe Premiere. Premier. Now, we received these, all of these videos, including 
the one that was absolute perfect or absolute difference. Absolute difference. I keep getting it wrong because it never seems perfect to me. But one of the things that I think the court needs to see is what is actually shown in that absolute difference video when you brighten it. Mr. No. Cheryl? Yes, sir. So I want to make very clear. Yes, sir. This is sentencing. Sentencing is for argument. The rules of evidence do not apply right. to this hearing. The state has argued facts that were not part of the trial right. in support of their position. So I'm going to let you argue. But the court does not view sentencing as a time to consider whether or not the conviction is based upon some error or false evidence. That is not the purpose of sentencing. I have to accept, and I do accept, as I believe the state has uh, indicated clearly, and I agree with it, that the defendant has been convicted of the offense that I will sentence him on. So I'm making this statement to you so you understand the context in which I will consider any comments in whatever form that you present. But I'm not going to weigh or consider um, any information um, as being an attack on uh, the uh, verdict of this jury. And I know you understand that. I, I do, Judge, and I'm not asking that you do anything about the verdict. My client has been found guilty, and he understands that. But what this court, as all courts must do, is consider <coughs> all the facts that can be presented that will go to the, the aggravated or mitigated nature of the facts of the case. The case law is quite clear that we can I believe can't... we've said the same thing, and I haven't told you you can't do what you're going to do. Okay. I'm trying to place into context for you and others exactly what I believe the limit of that information is. I understand. You can proceed. Thank you, sir. All right, Judge, so I am going to begin playing this absolute difference video. It's been brightened using the exact same programs that Mr. Armstrong had available to him and the state had available. And I'm gonna show it first at full speed and then I'm going to show it slower because it does impact upon the aggravated or mitigated nature of the facts of the case, knowing that he's been found guilty of this crime. Go ahead. That was just played at full speed, and I'm going to have it played slower as Mr. Armstrong did during the trial though this is obviously brightened in a manner that can be done. Do you want to 50% or slower than that? Do the 50%, please. This is at half speed. Okay, Judge, I am going to play it one more time, Judge. I'm going to do it a little slower, and I'm going to make some comments, if I may, as part of my argument on behalf of my client. Go ahead. It's not playing, Judge. <laughs> it 
And this is a video we understand wasn't seen during the trial. Yeah. A little unusual. We don't know why it was kept out. I'm looking at the notes from our producer, mm -hmm. apparently, and in a minute the, the defense attorney is going to make an argument that it shows, and we can't really see it, um, the victim tripping over a stool, mm. and that's what made him fall, not technically a punch. But I don't know. There's something we don't know yet, yeah. because that would be admitted into trial, I would think. Maybe it but we don't know. We're going to see what else yeah. we can find out. And of course, when we come back, we're going to take you back into the courtroom for more of the defense's argument. Stay tuned. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a shooting at a Georgia high school leaves a community stunned. We'll bring you everything we've learned about this tragedy and the suspected shooting. Closing Arguments with Vinny Politan. Tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Join Court TV's Vinny Politan with the latest and breaking true crime stories. Now, let's look at the other side of all of that. Vinny Politan investigates. Tonight, 9, 8 central, only on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Michael Ayala here with Judge Ashley Wilcott. We're in Wisconsin for sentencing in the tattoo punch murder trial. Defendant Kevin Seamer was found guilty of felony murder last month. Now Seamer will learn his fate for landing a fatal punch on victim Josh Davies, who eventually died after hitting his head on the concrete. Now this whole idea of whether he actually landed a punch is a big issue right mm -hmm. now. Let's get back into that courtroom for more of the sentencing for Kevin Seamer. The defense is presenting their part of the case. They're showing a video, and I believe they're suggesting that this this video shows that the defendant never actually punched the victim. Let's get back inside. The person that we have seen coming from right to left and we now see that seems to have kind of a lighter top with a somewhat darker <clears throat> bottom of shirt, that's Joshua. And I'm going to move it forward a moment and then ask to stop it again. Stop. Judge, it appears that something has fallen to the ground immediately in front of Joshua. Go ahead. It is, stop. The, the video appears to establish that Joshua then left his feet and moved towards Mr. Seamer, and it appears as if his body is torquing as if he were moving something like a stool. Go ahead and play. The, stop. What you can also see is that after Joshua falls, it appears as if his left foot or leg somehow makes contact with whatever that stool was or whatever on the ground, and it moved as if he had actually um, caused the stool to move as he went over the top of it. Thank you. Now, Judge, the reason that I have asked the court to see this is because the court was not able to see this <clears throat> during the trial. Courts have a right to make, as you do, rulings. And I understand that. I'm not asking you to second guess any rulings or change the verdict. But I think in deciding what it is that should happen to my client, because, as you know, my client's statement to law enforcement was that Joshua had tried to strike him with a stool, and my client stopped it. Now, the jury could have believed all of that and still said, well, we think that that was felony murder because he didn't have any right to defend himself. 
Um, but it doesn't seem to suggest that my client punched him, which isn't required for the verdict. It's just that he caused essentially a battery for which he may not have had any right to exercise because of provocation, which ultimately and horribly caused Joshua to die. He went to the ground and his head hit. Now, that is what I think that heightened video shows is that it is not likely that he actually punched him, but that doesn't matter because the jury could still find that he was guilty of felony murder. But it is different if the court thinks that, well, he's guilty of felony murder, but this may not be a circumstance where he was punching him that caused him to go to the ground and die. And all of that, Judge, is with a complete understanding and agreement by both my client as well as, of course, all of Joshua's family. All right, still with us, trial attorney and former president of the National Bar Association, C.K. Hoffler. C.K., what do you make of this? The defense bringing in in sentencing a piece of video that was not evidence in the case seems to show something that would have been helpful to their case. I'm not sure. I've been looking for and trying to figure out why it wasn't presented in case. He did say it was, quote, unquote, heightened video. Um, not sure what that means. Maybe it didn't pass muster to get into the main trial. But what do you make of what this uh, defense attorney is trying to do? Well, I think it's pretty clever because if indeed this evidence existed, I cannot imagine why he didn't try and possibly did to get it in at trial. I, I couldn't make out, I was looking at it and I was, I put on these, you know, I have this magnifying glass trying to see, <laughs> I couldn't make out what was being, what he was saying, um, it, you know, what he, what we were seeing. But if indeed it's what he described, that would certainly be exculpatory evidence and be very important for the jury to see. But it must have been too speculative. It must have been unreliable. There must have been some problem with that evidence because it would be reversible error for a judge not to allow that in if indeed it represents what he is purporting that it does represent. Now, I couldn't make heads or tails of it looking at it and squinting and using a magnifying glass, but that doesn't mean that maybe a jury could not have. So I think it's pretty clever to present that in an effort to say, look, judge, I'm not gonna, we're not challenging the, the, the jury verdict, but now is the sentencing stage. And when you make a determination as to whether he should go away for, for almost life, given he's a man of a certain age, take this into consideration. And he's allowed to do that. I think it's pretty clever. However, I couldn't make heads or tails out of what I was seeing. I didn't know when he said something fell down. I couldn't make that out. Just and we, we couldn't either. We not. couldn't either, and that's got to be one of the reasons it mm -hmm. was not admitted as evidence into the trial. But uh, here's my question for you. We know he was found guilty of felony murder during aggravated battery. He faces up to 30 years. Theoretically, if the judge saw that video and says, oh, yeah, this does help me understand, couldn't the judge choose to not can he change that conviction at this point? That's what I'm asking. I don't think the judge would, possibly could, change the conviction, but this is the sentencing stage. He has no prior convictions, so the judge can be more lenient, because mm. I think it's gonna be for the appellate process to make a determination as to whether there are any appellate appealable issues that the appellate court can consider. But I think the judge certainly can take that into consideration. And if it poses a real question for him in the interest of fairness, he can impose a sentence that he thinks is appropriate. Yeah. That's what I think is his purview. Yep, absolutely fair that he could do that. Thank you so much, C.K. Hoffler, for joining us. All right, folks, stick around because coming up, convicted murderer Kevin Seamer addresses the court ahead of his sentencing. We'll have that for you on the other side. Keep it right here on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. We begin this evening with the sentencing hearing in the tattoo punch murder trial in Wisconsin. Last month, the jury found Kevin Seamer guilty of felony murder in the death of Joshua Davies. Now, both men got into an argument after Seamer told Davies that his tattoos were a sin and he was going to go to hell. 
Well, the judge listened to victim impact statements earlier. Now the defense attorney is speaking. Let's head back into court. Ignite that my client acted really abominably. I mean, he, there wasn't. I mean, the, the family is right. I mean, Josh didn't deserve to even be yelled at, much less criticized for his tattoos. It's none of my client's business what tattoos he wears. That's just none of his business. And it isn't appropriate, nor is it very attractive to think that for himself and his family that what on earth are you doing? Why are you giving this young man this hard time about his tattoos? Now, the court is aware, as I think all the people in his courtroom are aware, that at some point, Joshua left. My client was speaking with his wife and the, the friend, and Joshua came back in. I'm not critical of him for doing it. I'm not. Whatever reason he wanted to come in and get his wife or whatever and call my client names, I, 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 I don't, I'm not objecting to that. I'm not critical of him. I'm not. I mean, he had probably had enough and is thinking, I think the re remark was something like, why are you speaking to this blah, blah, blah? Not an unreasonable question in his mind. As I saw it, I thought, well, I'd probably be thinking the same thing. What are you doing talking to this jerk? So, and then my client made the catastrophic decision to then go outside and confront him again. He shouldn't have. I mean, he just shouldn't have. The two women tried to stop him and he, and he didn't allow that, okay? So, when I show you this video, Judge, it is not because I'm trying to suggest that my client was guiltless, I'm not. I'm just trying to say it's a little different. And I think, it would have been, I think it's important for the court to see this because you get to see it and say, well, all right, okay, well, it isn't maybe as clear what exactly he did, but what is clear is that ultimately his actions caused Josh's death. We're there, that's what happened. So, and it is disturbing not just because of the cost. I mean, you know, the measure of mistake is its consequence, and I think Mrs. Davies made some reference some in another, another way of the same thing. I mean, you, you took a life. But I need to go back and talk a little bit about my client's history because we can't, you can't ignore his background, his life. This was a catastrophic decision he made, and the consequences are terrible. But I do take some exception, significant exception, to the state's argument that, oh, well, back in 2015, you know, Mrs. Seymour, you know, she went in and complained about their neighbor. Well, that's not actually what happened. What happened was is that the neighbor put his hands on my client's wife and pushed her down. And that's when my client's daughter ran into the house and said, Dad, you gotta come up. <clears throat> now, everybody has to deal with these circumstances in different ways. What I found shocking is that my client didn't punch him in the face because if somebody had laid their hands on my wife and pushed her down over flowers, I probably would have been less kind about it. I would have been very angry, which is why he, the neighbor, got a citation for disorderly conduct. So this notion that, oh, well, he, this is his more criminal behavior, no, that's not so. It's just not so. It was restraint, quite frankly, not aggression. Now, I do agree, though, with the state that his behavior with this young man at the dry cleaner was ridiculous. Throwing a towel at the manager or whatever, you know, pushing this young man, really inappropriate. And, and I do get that the state is saying, okay, well, what's going on with this man? What, what, why is he not able to control himself? Well. 
He got a ticket for that, as he deserved, quite frankly, and he paid the ticket and he understood. And, and, he, and he didn't fight it and accepted that. The other person, I think he got his ticket, I don't know, whatever he did, when he put his hands on my client's wife. But that does not suggest that we have a person who is a loose cannon, who needs to be caged because he is so dangerous. It is true, and I agree, that his behavior that night was not only catastrophic in that it caused the death of somebody, but it wasn't somebody looking to do something terrible to somebody. I mean, that's just not what this was. Because of what I do, and probably your history and my and counsel's history, I understand that people who get in fights in bars or anywhere, we don't quite know where that's all going to lead. And I remember talking to all of my kids, my boys. As long as they were old enough to understand that you don't get to control how these things happen. You know, you're in a tavern, you're at some place, and you decide you get angry, and you're going to get in a fight. You don't know how that is going to end. It's not necessarily going to be something like we see on TV. Somebody gets punched, and it all goes away. We don't know. And I've explained to my clients that I've had cases where fights caused one death and two really terrible injuries. You know, I, I, I remember a client who pushed somebody and the person's head hit the back of a truck. And terrible things happen and nobody really wanted that, but it does happen and there's a consequence. So I've always tried to convince my kids you don't know. Once you once violence can start, you don't have a as much control over how that's going to end up. But the court is then left with this terrible decision to make on what do we do? Because somebody did die. But if it's a push of stopping somebody because they tried to hit you with a stool, and that ends up causing somebody, for various reasons that the court and the parties all are aware of, causes him to go to the ground and then t suffer this terrible injury. Well, th that's something the court has to accept. But this is not a case where we see a fight that goes on, where somebody goes down and then another person starts kicking him. It's not like that. You've seen those cases. Council has prosecuted those cases, but it isn't that. And we can't simply say that, well, the fact that he went to 65 years without ever being convicted or even charged with any criminal offense doesn't matter because it did happen here. That, that's not reasonable either. It's not part of the factors that the court has to consider. His, the history of the defendant is important. Does he have a history of doing this? And I don't think an argument at a car wash is anything like this. It's stupid and creepy, but it wasn't, you know, violent. And it doesn't suggest that my clients, 30 years of working, raising a family, raising and taking care of a father-in-law who is, because of age and infirmity, needing care, it doesn't mean that he's not that person. I mean, he is that person. And I, it is so hard to listen to families who've lost loved ones because there is no fixing that. And I understand why they want a significant punishment. I get that. 
but the court is in a different position. And I obviously don't agree with the state that somebody who, whether through, through one punch or just blocked a stool and then left, is somebody who deserves 15 years in prison is wrong. That is not a measured response that the court should take, nor should the prosecution advocate. I understand why the family does, but the court is a different circumstance. He is somebody who led a good life and helped people throughout his life, like Josh helped people. Unfortunately, he made a terrible decision for which he's already spent, and I, I think, Judge, I was wrong in my sentencing memo because I forgot the first eight days. There's 428 days of credit because he was charged, released, and then charged again, and then stayed in custody. But for somebody who's never been in jail before, who's never been accused of anything like this before, the notion that he should go to prison until he's 79 seems excessive, Judge. And I don't think it's the measured, reasonable response that the court should make, given his history. And so I'm not asking for a slap on the wrist. My client has spent over a year in jail, Judge. You know, straight time. It's not like he had some Huberson's. He's been in a jail cell for a long time facing these charges. And it seems to me that to the extent that the state says, well, we need to be ensured that the, uh, he is not a danger, as this court knows, probation is always the first thing the court should consider. And for somebody who's 65 years old and has no criminal record other than this case, that seems to be the appropriate <coughs> punishment. Now, the court can either impose and stay a long prison term, can do a wealth withheld sentence. But it seems to me that probation can monitor somebody who has gone his whole life without being charged with a crime. And the court can issue any other conditions that the court may think are appropriate. But a person who's 64 at the time this occurred, who'd never been charged with a crime before, and who then had to serve a jail term, that I think that first consideration, which all judges must give, which is probation, that's the appropriate case here. That is not saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't say that Josh's life doesn't matter, because of course it matters. It doesn't mean that his family's pain isn't real. It's obviously real. But the court's position is not that of the family. And I understand their position, but I don't think the court should accept that position. And so I'm asking that the court uh, impose and stay a prison term and place him on probation for as long as you think he needs, given his age and his lack of criminal record. And I do know that he does want to speak to the court. Any other comments, Mr. Shiro? Folks, we have some breaking news just coming into our newsroom. We found out that the suitcase murder trial going on in Florida involving defendant Sarah Boone, well, she has officially filed her notice of intent to use the battered spouse syndrome. Boone claims that her boyfriend, Jorge Torres, abused her. She's charged with second-degree murder in his death. And remember, he was found inside a suitcase zipped up. Boone initially said it was a case of hide-and-seek gone wrong. Well, Boone's trial is scheduled to begin next month. We will continue to follow developments and bring you the latest. All right, we do need to take a break now, folks. When we come back, we'll have more from the sentencing hearing of convicted killer Kevin Seamer. So keep it here on Court TV. The WNBA is on IHOP. The Minnesota Lynx battle the fever in Indy. A big McBucket! Followed by the Los Angeles Sparks taking on the sky in Chicago. Coverage starts tonight at 7. Check local listings for games in your area. IHOP, it's on.
Tonight on Closing Arguments, a shooting at a Georgia high school leaves a community stunned. We'll bring you everything we've learned about this tragedy and the suspected shooting. Closing Arguments with Vinny Politan. Tonight at 8, 7 Central, only on Court TV. All right, we want to get you right back to the sentencing hearing of Kevin Seamer in the tattoo punch murder trial in Wisconsin. Seamer's getting set to speak quickly. His attorney just argued to the court that he should just get time served and then probation. He served about 14 months already. He is facing a total of 30 years. Let's get back into court. Your Honor, Josh's family and friends. Please allow me to express my sincere <clears throat> remorse and sympathy for the loss of Josh, a son, a father, a husband, and a friend. I also wanted to express My sorrow for my abhorrent behavior that fateful night in the bar on initial induction, introductions, a sincere low point in my life. What I took from you all and feel extreme anguish Every single day, I'm sorry, every single day since that fateful night, I think of Josh and what I took from you and all feel his, feel extreme anguish. Every sleepless night, I wake from a dream with a different outcome. But that truth, sadly, is always the same. Most of all, I hope that Josh's family and friends can come to some sort of peace, which has transpired. I do not dare ask them for forgiveness when I'll never be able to forgive myself. Please, I'm begging you to accept my repentance and apology. I am 65 years old, and I have never been in jail in my life. I've never been arrested before. The last 14 months have been, I've been a model inmate. That night, I know everybody's searching for answers, and I don't have any that can put anybody to peace. I don't know why I went outside when I did. Something triggered it, and I don't know why. My behavior prior to that was unspeakable. It's not who I am. I'm a family man with two college educated adult kids who I'm extremely proud of. I am nothing without my family, <laughs> nothing. I only hope Josh's family and friends can please find it somewhere deep in their heart to forgive me. I know I never will forgive myself. Thank you.
before the court pronounces sentence. All right, let's bring in our guest. Joining us to discuss in this hour is coming to defense attorney, former prosecutor Franz Borgart for our Fridays with Franz. Franz, great to see you. Um, you know, this is not to give him a pass. Uh, someone is dead in this instance. He certainly did act like a jerk. He acknowledged that. But it, the, the one thing that's coming to my mind is, and we've talked about this before, we're never who we are at the worst moment in our life. And, and maybe, again, I don't know him according to what his attorney said, the way he seems to be saying, this is not who he is, and this might have been the worst day of his life. He couldn't quite explain it. But, you know, they need to show this video to Ali Abulaban to what remorse really looks like. Well, I, I, and I agree. That was very remorseful, his, his statement. Uh, he seems contrite. And look, at the end of the day, this was felony murder. It's not, he didn't intend to kill this person. Um, it's one of those freak occurrences that was absolutely preventable, but absolutely not intended. So one of the many factors that they look at, that the court looks at, at is the single act itself. But they look at other factors too, which I think his defense attorney did a wonderful job, both conceding his wrongdoing, but also pointing out that this is the only time he's ever been in trouble. This is his only criminal act. He's 65 years old. These are factors. You know, what is the likelihood of recidivism on a crime like this? These are all factors the judge can consider. And, and look, the other piece is, if he gave him 10 years, that could be a death sentence to this guy. So, you know, I, I think we saw, we just witnessed a very good, compelling argument from the defense. Do I think the judge maybe gives him a little bit more time? Sure, but I don't know that he's looking at significant big numbers and he may just land on probation. I, I think there's an argument for that. I think the state is asking for like 20. I think by statute, he can get as much as 30. His attorney asked for basically the 14 months, but now put him on probation for whatever term of years the judge decides. But he put on an interesting presentation. He had to walk a fine line. He was a little bit critical of the victim, but he was respectful in the way he did it, trying to say on one level, some of the way my client acted was as a result of the way the victim acted under those circumstances. We certainly understand, this is what he told the court, we understand why he acted that way, but some of that has to be factored in. But the most important thing, or interesting thing that I thought was he tried to show some video that might have suggested that a punch never actually landed, that the fall was caused by a trip over a stool in some way, which never made it into trial. I wasn't sure exactly what it showed. He couldn't make it out here uh, through our, our monitors. But what do you make of his attempt there to bring in some evidence? And the judge said, look, there's not evidence in the trial, but he was trying to bring it in here during sentencing. I think it's dangerous, right? Mm. Because he's already, he's gone to trial, which means he, he didn't take responsibility during the trial, right? But there's some argument wiggle room there. Um, I think it's dangerous to do that. I think it, it kind of, it kind of diminishes what's going on. Now, that being said, nobody's going to tell me that he isn't sorry. That that statement he made, I think, was sincere. I think he really is sorry, and I don't think he wanted this, this death to occur. Um, you know, look, good defense advocacy sometimes is looking at your client and saying, Judge, you know, you can hate the sin, but we love the sinner. We, we don't we don't flush the sinner just because of one bad, isolated act. Um, and I, you know, I think walking that fine line, he did a really good job, Michael. And look, at the end of the day, this is not an easy decision for a judge. This Sometimes it's easy for a judge, right? 20 years, 30 years, that's easy. It, when it's a really heinous, uh, you know, violent crime where they wanted to do it, they thought about doing it, and they did it. This is different. Now, again, you heard his attorney say, shouldn't have made the statement about the tattoos. It's not his role to do that. And in fact, had he not done that, Nobody would be dead, he wouldn't be sitting in orange, and he wouldn't be looking at upwards of 30 years. So I think he did a great job walking that fine line. I did not like bringing that video back in because it's, it's kind of a, hey, by the way, just a reminder, I didn't take responsibility during the trial. Yeah, that, that's how I felt about it as well. I'm not sure it was worth it. Uh, the juice was worth the squeeze, as they say. All right, Franz, stand by. Before we go to break, we do have this programming note for you folks. Court TV is gearing up for its next big case, the My Daughter Did It murder trial in Florida. Lori Shaver is accused of killing her husband, Michael, but she claims her now teenage daughter confessed to her that she shot and killed Michael Shaver when she was seven years old. Well, the teen is expected to testify. Well, Court TV 
cameras will be there to cover the trial, and it all begins on Monday, September 9th. All right, let's take that break now. When we come back, the judge will begin his sentencing of Kevin Seymour in the tattoo punch murder trial. So keep it here on your front row seat to justice. We have more breaking news for you, this time out of New Mexico in the Rust shooting case involving actor Alec Baldwin. Deadline reports that efforts to reopen the case have failed. Baldwin was in court when his manslaughter case was dismissed in July because the state failed to disclose critical evidence to the defense. Special Prosecutor Kerry Morrissey submitted a 52-page filing to the judge trying to get that overturned. But Judge Mary Marlow Summers said the filing was far too long and should have been by law 10 pages long unless permission was granted for more, which she did not have. Baldwin was charged after cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed as Baldwin rehearsed a scene for the movie. The film's armor was convicted and sentenced to 19 months behind bars, and an assistant director took a plea deal after that shooting in 2021. All right, we do want to get back now to the tattoo punch murder trial in Wisconsin, where defendant Kevin Seymour is being sentenced. The judge is now making his statement and will give his sentence, so let's head back to court. A restitution review. In about 60 days. So let's get that on the record. John, I have you. Oh, I've got mine. It's okay. Now, uh, clerk. Friday, November 8th. <laughs> either earlier that day or in the afternoon, if you want to stick with the eighth, please. You don't, you can't do morning? Earlier in the morning. Oh, yeah. I can't do earlier. Okay, what time? I didn't hear, what time? Let's try Monday, November 11th. Sure. This is a status date, not yeah. a hearing date. How about, uh, is 11 okay? Yeah? Yes. Okay, that will be the restitution status date. Mr. Seymour, my job today is one that is difficult. And frankly, I've done this for 15 years and I've uh, loved almost everything that I've done as a judge. But these hearings are taxing and they're difficult. And I consider myself to be a, someone who absorbs a lot of the emotion in the room that makes me a better judge. But oftentimes it wears, and it has today, and it has over time, as I listen to the evidence in this case. I do have a very precise obligation, the law dictates, that is to consider your character, the need to protect the public from you, and the nature and gravity of the offense that you've committed. I am to assess uh, and what are called aggravated and mitigated facts and circumstances. And I'm going to recite my belief as to what fits into the categories that are important to me as I assess and met out a sentence for you. I do want to express to um, Josh's family, my profound um, sorrow for his loss, and uh, express the fact that um, how unfair uh, the events that led to his loss are. Um, I have a sense of his um, presence and his willingness to be kind of an independent character uh, as he enjoyed um, his life and uh, was connected in really a three-dimensional way with the other human beings in his life. That's what we all hope for as we have this limited path that we all share. It all has a conclusion for all, each of us every day. 
for Josh far too soon. The process of sentencing um, is one in a civilized uh, society that we have in our country, um, which distinguishes us uh, from many places around the world that simply use arbitrary violence. And I know some may feel more um, strongly because of the impacts to them uh, as to sort of how arbitrary the loss was here and how it should be met with that same response. But that is not the system that I've dedicated almost 40 years of my life to. It does require consideration of all facts, positive and negative. The aggravated facts are primarily, in this case, related to the facts surrounding that evening, the conduct of the defendant. I agree with the state that I don't believe that Mr. Seymour wanted to kill Josh, but I do believe that Mr. Seymour wanted to hurt him. And I believe it was fueled out of a recklessness, fueled by alcohol, that I bore witness to from a video of inside Tabby's bar, which was much clearer in terms of the interaction of a drunken man in that moment making fateful choices, beginning with a verbal attack on someone he had just met. Now, we all have days, and I think anyone looking in the mirror would acknowledge this, where we have uh, moments of underperformance in our life, wishes we could do again, and moments when we say or do something which is, we wish not to be reflective of our character. But Mr. Seymour's comments and conduct in the bar, if it were the only thing that happened, it simply <coughs> reflects someone who I believe uh, possessed a anger and almost hatred for what he saw as something that he had dislike for within that moment. And I'm sorry about that. We have a lot of hate in this world. And it's directed in a lot of different ways. And I am profoundly saddened when I see it, as I saw it in that video, because there's so much more for all of us than that, that simple, uh, thin, self-centered, arrogant emotion. Now, that isn't where it stopped. So the aggravating facts included Mr. Seymour's choice to, in my words, launch himself out of Tabby's bar because he was offended, apparently, that uh, Joshua, in asking his wife to leave, referred to him as a uh, swear word. All right, the judge acknowledging this is a difficult thing for him. So we'll take a break here. Coming up next, we'll get you back to the tattoo punch murder trial where the judge will issue a sentence for defendant Kevin Seymour. So keep it here on Court TV.
Two celebrities reveal their turbulent relationship to the world. He was just Hollywood's mega hunk. The man who beat me up for five years. The general public sees this, and all they see is wife beater. Two completely different versions of what was happening. That means one thing. Somebody's lying. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. New season premieres Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. Welcome back, folks. The judge is now getting to the sentencing portion in the tattoo punch murder trial. So let's get right back into court. I will impose a 12-year period of imprisonment. Seven years of initial confinement, followed by five years of extended supervision. The court will order costs to be paid by the defendant. And my clerk will tell me what that amount is in a moment. $518. The court will require conditions of extended supervision, which includes absolute sobriety, no possession of any alcohol or consumption. And the defendant, when on extended supervision, following his service in prison, will test to verify his sobriety. Uh, the court will provide credit to the defendant for his service in the Waukesha County Jail. <coughs> Mr. Shiro has offered 428 days. What is the position of the state? Close, we came up with 423. He only spent two days in custody during that first stint. <coughs> According to our records from, yeah, June 18th and then released on June 19th. It didn't happen until the 17th. So you have two days? Two and then 421, so 423. Okay. The court's going to indicate 423 days of credit. Uh, the judgment of conviction will not be signed for probably a couple of days, so if there's an issue or dispute regarding that, you can submit a letter, but that will be what I will indicate on this record uh, today. The court will require that the defendant comply with all um, programming offered by his uh, and required by his agent when he's on extended supervision sign and sign any releases of information. There isn't a lot that I can do in terms of uh, community service structure. Drunk drivers, frankly, we have a much more impactful manner, but in a way, this is reflected by uh, this event by what I believe is the defendant's consumption of alcohol. So the court is going to require the defendant's attendance at a victim impact panel uh, when he is on extended supervision because I believe it at least would provide some observation of the trauma and impact on victims. I don't think you have anything. Anything else from the state? No, sir. Thank you. Anything else from the defense? Judge, uh, I played the video, so I'm going to move move it into evidence. Oh, which one? This one? This one. Okay. Because it has to be our guy. So it's not an evidentiary hearing, but you're asking me to have it in the record? Yes. As part of the sentencing? Yes. Is there any objection? I just have a question. Is it's saved in the Brighton format that you yes. played it in? Okay, thank you. No judge. All right. It's gonna be placed as a thumb drive in the sentencing hearing portion Thanks. as exhibit, um, what are we up to? Exhibit one for this hearing. Thank you. Mr. Seamer. I want you to hopefully think about some of the comments that were made here today, not in the moment when you're feeling stress and pressure about what the outcome is or what the near future may hold in your life. 
I hope that you um, consider what I have indicated in terms of the ability of individuals to seek improvement. We have many, and I think we are awash, fortunately, in this country with people of difference. There is no room for us to not accept each other. And I hope and pray that you can find the capacity and tolerance to demonstrate that better in the future than you did on this occasion. I want to wish you good luck, sir. That's it. Thank you. All right, so 12 years total, seven years mandatory in prison, five years on probation, and absolute sobriety. And he will be tested weekly to make sure that he stays. Seems like the judge put a lot of the fault of this onto alcohol and his drinking. Still with me to discuss, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Franz Borgart. Franz, the final statistics. He was facing up to 30. The state was asking for 21, 15 mandatory in prison, seven on probation. Judge kind of split it right down the middle as far as the defense was basically asking for probation, gave him 12 years total, seven years mandatory in prison, five years probation, and again, those stipulations when he gets out to remain uh, sober and he'll be tested weekly. What do you make of it? So let's assume that the Department of Corrections in that state is going to have him serve seven actual years, minus the 423 days of credit he just got. Um, you know, it's it's fair, right? It's it's a fair sentence. Uh, it gives him more jail time. It gives him an opportunity and hope to get out one day, uh, based on his age. Um, I, this is a tough one. I said earlier, Michael, this is a tough one. And, and I like this sentence because it's about balance. It's about more jail time. But, you know, when we let him out, he's going to have five years kind of hanging over his head um, where he can't drink anymore. He can't do that life anymore, which in large part, as you said earlier, a large portion of the culprit of this case was the alcohol. So I think this is a solid sentence from the court. I, I think, you know, whether he likes it or not, um, this is a victory for the defense. It's a, it's a victory for the victims as well, because again, it's a balanced sentence that he's going to do some more jail time. And it's very well possible he could die in jail. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, this, is, this is a tough one, and he, I think the judge did a good job on it. Yeah, so he's 65 now. He'll get out uh, if everything goes right. About 72 years old. Still plenty of life left uh, for him under those circumstances. Um, you saw there towards the end, the defense attorney trying to get that video that we talked about on the record uh, in some way. The judge says, hey, this wasn't an evidentiary hearing, but he wanted it on the record. Is there any way that that video, and again, I don't know the history of it, why it wasn't admitted into the initial trial. Maybe there were issues in terms of verifying it or how, what you could actually see from it, et cetera, et cetera. But is that something that could be the basis for an appeal at some point, whether of the sentence or of the initial verdict? So not allowing the video in during the trial may be a basis of an appeal. I don't know that, look, the court considered it as a part of the sentencing. So I don't know that it's gonna be an issue of appeal for the defense um, on, 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 on the sentencing portion. Um, <sighs> You know, that it's tough because, again, it doesn't get this defendant away from the fact that he, st he started the fight and because of that, someone's dead now. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, my bet is that uh, this guy just wants to serve his time. He seems so remorseful about this whole thing. Franz Borkard, thank you so much for being with us. Truly appreciate it. As always, coming up in our next hour, the defendant in the Idaho student murders case wants the death penalty taken off the table. We'll tell you about that. Also, with just days until her trial, accused murderer Donna Adelson is back in court for a hearing. And the judge had one key thing to tell her. And the team accused of killing four people and injuring nine others at a Georgia high school. And his father, who's now charged in the case, makes their first court appearance. Keep it here on Court TV.